Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this interview for the ISQG Outreach Project. My name is Davide De Biasio, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Stefan Gillen. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yes, that's right. Thank you. That's perfect. So after having obtained your PhD from the University of Cambridge, you had your fair share of traveling, postdocs, research positions and all that before obtaining a senior research fellow position at the University of Sheffield. Dr. Gillen, thank you very much for having accepted our invitation. Hi, Davide. Thank you. Would you like to briefly outline for us your research interests? Yeah, of course. Um, so broadly, I, I work on the connection of quantum gravity and, and cosmology. Um, so I've always been interested in, in quantum gravity in, in, in various forms, um, approaches such as loop quantum gravity, group field theory, and, and, and others. But more specifically, I always thought that somehow the main connection to something we could observe uh, would be in cosmology. So that's really my uh, the main motivation behind a lot of my research. Um, so what I'm generally interested in is how to go from the, the complicated mess of quantum gravity um, to something that perhaps one day we could present to a cosmologist who doesn't know anything about quantum gravity and make a connection there. Well, that's extremely interesting. And I mean, those are the topics we'll have the pleasure of this. I mean, I'll have this ple the pleasure of interviewing you about today, on today. So before starting with the quantum and uh, uh, weird stuff uh, related to quantum gravity, I think it might be reasonable to uh, set the stage, namely discuss uh, cosmology itself a bit. You mentioned cosmology, right? As a place where something interesting concerning quantum gravity might be found. Well, would you like to uh, kind of outline for us what cosmology is? What do we know about cosmology in the general relativistic context without quantum gravity and all that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Thank so, you. of course, cosmology is a very, very old subject. I mean, humans have always thought about the history of the universe and somehow where we come from and maybe where we're going in the future. Um, and somehow had their own theories about that. But but yes, general relativity is sort of where we start making progress in terms of mathematically, you know, established models um, that have a grounding in, in science. Um, so general relativity is our theory for, for gravity that we think is correct or might be correct up to some small modifications perhaps that are needed later. It certainly is a theory that that you know has passed a lot of experimental tests and therefore is our best description as a starting point for the universe as a whole on the larger scales, right? So the, when we're doing cosmology, we're really looking beyond say, you know, the solar system or even the Milky Way. We are interested in the universe as a whole on, on scales that are much, much, much larger than, than galaxies. And so we want to have some kind of description of what the universe is doing on these large scales. So in particular, the most basic question you could ask is whether the universe is in some kind of stationary state or some kind of static configuration, something that's eternal, right? Was always there, will always be there kind of unchanged or whether it's dynamical, yes. right? And that's kind of the biggest um, the biggest understanding of, uh, of about a hundred years ago, observations of, of galaxies um, that are kind of at different distances from us for the first time indicated that the universe actually is dynamical, it's expanding, right? So this was an, an absolutely big breakthrough in, in our understanding of, of the universe, um, which we can, you know, understand by observing that galaxies are all seem to be all moving away from us, right? So if we look at different galaxies in all directions in the sky, they're somehow all moving away from us. And the further away they are, the, f the faster they seem to be moving which can best understand by a dynamical expanding universe. Somehow like on an inflating balloon, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, it's a bit, that's a really good analogy. Yeah, of course, it's really difficult because it's high dimensional. So we have to, we have to imagine something that's three dimensional, but also dynamical. And a lot of people find that difficult. But yeah, if you like the two dimensional analogy, you can think of the balloon that is expanding balloon. and sitting on the surface. So yeah. given the fact that we know that our space-time is dynamical and we know that our space-time is expanding, what about 
going in the other direction, like trying to go back in time. This mm -hmm. is something people have done, right? Would you like to comment on this? Go yeah, exactly. So, right. So that's that's one of the immediate kind of follow up questions, right? Is sort of you, if the universe is expanding today, you know, can we go back and understand where it came from? And what about the past? Um, you know, was was there an infinite past or was there perhaps a beginning? Um, and yes, yeah, so if you ask that question, you study it within general relativity, you can look at the equations and they're, they're reasonably simple to solve for simple cosmological models. And you indeed find that there was a beginning. Somehow you can you can go back only a finite amount of time. And then it looks like the universe came out of basically zero size, right? So the the, the, the radius of whatever you're, you're looking at today, if you go backwards in time, it must have come from nothing. And this is, of course, the big mystery. And 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 this is where you know we then say we have the Big Bang, right? The Big Bang is somehow this beginning where everything came out of, um, yeah, something that had zero size in a sense, whatever that means. Yes. Well, in a sense, keeping using again a balloon analogy, if you see your balloon, the balloon you live on is inflating and you try to, you know, extrapolate backwards in time, you find that your balloon at, at a certain point in time, a finite distance from you, was just a point, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. We would say a singularity in general. That's right. Right? Yes. But singularities are not really well-defined things, are them? Or are they problematic in general? Mm -hmm. So you can you can look at this in two ways. So one is from the perspective of geometry. So in general relativity, the conceptually, the new idea is that space-time, space and time are described as geometric entities, right? So they can they can stretch and they can bend and they can expand and things like this, a bit like the balloon that you were using as an analogy. And so one can characterize a singularity in terms of geometric quantities. So in particular, one can look at something like curvature. <laughs> so, you know, if you, if you have this kind of uh, sort of spherical model for the universe, then as the universe grows, the local curvature goes to zero because mm -hmm. the, the curvature is kind of sort of scales inversely with the, typically with the square of the, of the size of this, of this sphere which means that as you go back in time, somehow this curvature goes to infinity. Yes. So in terms of geometry, our usual notions of geometry break down. Um, that's one way of doing it, but you can also look at sort of more physical quantities that you might measure. So things like temperature or the energy density in the universe, and they also all go to, to infinity. So all of these things diverge. So you would, if you were an observer, you know, he would have said you came out of this state of infinite temperature or infinite energy density. And so this clearly shows that sort of our usual concepts mm -hmm. of physics apply to this to this model breakdown completely. Well, that's a, a good point, right? That usually when things blow up, it means our models fail, not nature, mm -hmm. right? So uh, a thing right. happened while people were trying to solve the black body radiation problem, right? And they come up, came up with quantum mechanics. Well, would you like to present in a brief form or like just roughly in the way that will be in a way which will be useful later, quantum mechanics? Then we'll try to let the two merge. But first of all, what is quantum mechanics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's a great question, which is uh, not that easy to answer. Um, so it's sort of, I mean, what people often emphasize about quantum mechanics is that it's a fundamental shift in how we view physics from sort of a deterministic approach to physics to something that has only probabilities and uncertainty, right? So the traditional approach to physics was that, you know, if I'm preparing an experiment, and I know, say, I have a, a gas of particles or some some system that I want to study, and I know all the positions of mm -hmm. the particles, theoretically, of course, this is just a hypothetical situation, and their initial velocities and things like this, I would predict the future evolution for all times. I would know what happens for the rest of the lifetime of the universe, right? This is this kind of idea of perfect um, determinism. And quantum mechanics changes that because we have something that is deterministic, which is the quantum state, but the measurements that we can extract from the state um, are not unique. So in general, there will be many possible outcomes. So even if I prepare my initial state and in some system in a way that I understand, mm 
I don't know exactly what the future outcome is. So I will have a range of different outcomes that, that happen with certain probabilities. And there's nothing I can do about that in terms of, you know, looking more closely, making better, better, more refined measurements. Um, I will always have this probabilistic nature. So that's that's one thing. And the other thing is where the name quantum comes from. It's basically the idea that sort of certain quantities that we think of as continuous in usual physics, they can now only appear with certain specific discrete values. So a good example is the hydrogen atom. So, so classic, you have this simple model of the hydrogen atom where you have the proton and the electron going around. Now, classically, I can give this, this electron some energy, or maybe I can describe the radius of this orbit and all values are in principle allowed. So this is a continuum, right? I can think of the, the electron in a, in, a, in a range of orbits that have a continuum, but quantum mechanically, that's not true. There's only a certain sort of discrete set of, of configurations that are allowed by the theory. So the, the energy values, for example, um, can only take specific values. So if I make a measurement that sort of measures kind of these energy differences, for example, for the hydrogen atom, there's only a certain set of numbers that I can possibly get. So this continuum is replaced by discrete things. And this somehow tends to somehow stabilize these infinities and, and catastrophes. Well, uh, well, I think this was extremely clear. Thank you very much. And thank you also for pointing out a very important distinction in quantum mechanics, namely that between the evolution of the quantum state itself which, I mean, is unique and deterministic, mm -hmm. I mean, unitary, in a sense, at least, is the mm -hmm. mechanics. So really, uh, the, the best you can have, right? You can go back and mm -hmm. forth time however you like, and measurements, right? When you measure something, there's an intrinsic probability you cannot remove. Uh, uh, well, you could, in principle, but losing other important stuff, but we will not get into that today, but at least there's some kind of intrinsic probability that is different from what you have in classical systems. And I, I'm stressing this because afterwards I will try to ask you some questions when we get into quantum cosmology and quantum gravity and all that, because when you have a, a, an electron and you want to do a measurement on an electron, it's quite easy to figure out what we mean by that. When uh, with cosmology, things are a, a bit harder, at least conceptually. Yeah. Before going there and keeping this in the back of our minds, uh, just to, to make it clear, on one hand, you describe general relativity, right? A dynamical space-time with no probabilities whatsoever. And on the mm -hmm. other, you described quantum mechanics with probabilities and things evolving, uh, the hydrogen atom. You never mentioned space-time. Mm -hmm. What about using the two together, which is what people would like to do, for instance, when you know, the Big Bang and all that, but uh, at the very basic level, at the, at the, like, why is that a hard problem? What's the problem there at all? Like, is there a problem at all in trying to use in the two together? Why do we need quantum gravity? What's the issue? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's, there's quite a few <laughs> questions there, I guess. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so why why do we need quantum gravity? So yeah, as you as you say, we have these kind of two different worlds where sort of one of them is is our understanding of space time in terms of geometry, um, which is uh, a very beautiful theory, but has nothing to do with the quantum world uh, a priori, which is the world of fundamental forces and elementary particles and all the usual stuff that we that we study in the in the lab. Um, now, I think since the early days, I mean, these two theories were developed almost at the same time, about 100 years ago, people were asking almost from the beginning, you know, whether we shouldn't find a framework that combines the two. Um, and of course, the reason is that you can easily come up with a situation where you are interested in gravity and you are interested in, 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 in space time, but you're also interested in quantum mechanics. Um, so, I mean, you can ask a simple situation where sort of you prepare a quantum state in the lab, maybe of some particularly heavy object in such a way that you should already detect the impact that, that this kind of lab system has in terms of gravity, right? So gravity is universal. So all systems, whatever they are, um, ha have to have an impact on, on, on space time and on, on gravity. 
Um, but at the same time, we know that essentially all the systems we usually describe on an everyday basis are quantum systems. So there has to be some way of these two theories to talk to each other. Um, and of course, when we talk about the early universe and cosmology, the situation becomes even more pressing because somehow then the universe is very small and you have these high densities and high temperatures and so on. So everything at some point starts being quantum just because, you know, it's kind of so small and, and uh, sort of subatomic on a certain level. Um, so it seems hard to avoid the conclusion that the two have to be merged into a, into a coherent framework, although some people still follow the idea that there may be a consistent way of coupling classical mm -hmm. gravity um, with quantum systems. And that may be, may be true that such a thing is possible, but we don't know yet. Um, now, the attempts that to, to combine the theories have um, proven to be quite, quite difficult to, to achieve. Um, and the reason is that the two frameworks, I would say, they speak very different languages. I mean, they start from completely different starting points. Um, and somehow you would have to have a framework um, that somehow incorporates all of that. At least this is how we usually think of it. Mm -hmm. So you have to have something that is about geometry, that is about you know, space-time being dynamical, you know, no external structures, no kind of background clock ticking in the back. Um, everything has to be determined from the, you know, from the relationship between the geometry and the matter that is inside the universe, at the same time following all the rules of quantum mechanics. And in a sense, you know, even on their own, these two are quite complicated theories. So in a sense, you're now adding all the complication together and you're trying to build something that is uh, compatible with both and that turns out to be quite difficult well if i can summarize then tell me tell me if you're fine with my summary uh, before the 20th century we had we had this nice picture of classical physics uh, meaning like you know like electrodynamics thermodynamics and all that we had a, a whole variety of different phenomena all following classical physics and living on a fixed newtonian space time mm -hmm. space and time i mean <laughs> we can call it space time but at the time they didn't use this combined word then special relativity but general relativity in particular taught us that this idea of an eternal time uh, a universal time a universal notion of space and time had to uh, be thrown away and uh, substituted by something a bit more complicated, a bit weirder, like this dynamical stretching and bending space-time. While on the other hand, quantum mechanics told us we had to give up on classical dynamics, right? Uh, understanding of the world without probabilities, F equals M, A and all that, right? At least at the fundamental level, in an approximate way, both things are perfectly fine, but at a fundamental level. And in a sense, there are good reasons, not only conceptual, even though conceptual reasons are strong, but also practical, like cosmology. We didn't mention, uh, I mean, we didn't get into the, the, the singularities appearing in black holes and all that, but mm -hmm. even your uh, standard experimental setting with a massive quantum particle is a good, you know, practical motivation for at least trying to develop a conceptual framework in which both the things I mentioned at the beginning can be given up at the same time, right? Can be thrown away at the same time. We need a dynamical space time and quantum mechanics at least, right? Are you fine with this? Yeah. <laughs> Are you happy? That sounds well, good, yeah. So now we get into, <laughs> into the, you know, the main part of our discussion, namely having defined general relativity in quantum mechanics. I will follow up on what you said before, you mentioned two approaches to the problem of quantum gravity, because the problem of quantum gravity, we said that before, is not solved at all. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing all these outreach mm -hmm. activities and all that. Right? I mean, that's the whole point of it. So there are various approaches to the problem, clearly, with different names and, and all that. You mentioned loop quantum gravity and group field theories. I mean, would you like to briefly describe that? I mean, not necessarily briefly, we have a lot of time, but maybe starting from loop quantum gravity, maybe trying to assess what that is, present it, and then moving to group field theories, which might be a bit less intuitive. I mean, not that loop quantum gravity is, but even <laughs> a bit less, and then to applications to cosmology. Do you agree on this plan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that sounds good. Um, awesome. Yeah, so 
sort of one of the one of the earliest ideas that people had um, in in working towards sort of quantum gravity, bringing together these two frameworks, was to apply the rules of what we call canonical quantization. So canonical quantization is what we teach people who learn about quantum mechanics as a way of getting from a classical system to a quantum system. So fundamentally, you know, most of the theories in physics that we can think of. Um, at least initially, come from some classical picture of uh, of the way physics should work. So in a simple, again, we can go back to the hydrogen atom. We have this idea that there's a proton and an electron, and these are particles, and they have a certain mass, and they have an electric charge, and so on and so forth. And of course, these pictures eventually turn out to be not extremely correct in describing the, the physics. Um, but this is how we first started thinking about atoms. And of course, in many experiments, you can actually observe this particle-like structure and you can somehow see that there is something in the middle that has a certain mass and charge and something around that seems to have a certain mass and, and charge and so on and so forth. So then we have an idea of what the classical theory is that might be a good description. It clearly fails to describe some of the phenomena. We have to turn it into a quantum theory. And so we apply these rules. And this is in a sense some kind of cooking recipe. I mean, it just says, you know, take certain quantities and turn them into some other quantities and somehow it works, right? And for the hydrogen atom, somehow this really does the job, I mean, to a very good precision. At some point, of course, higher corrections come in and so on. But if you apply these simple rules, you get a reasonably good description of what's going on. And you can calculate, for example, these energy eigenvalues that are allowed and you get pretty good answers. So it was kind of natural to say we should do the same thing for general relativity. We should just take our classical theory that we love and we know what it is, we understand it very well, and we apply these kind of you know, textbook recipes of canonical quantization, we get some kind of quantum theory. And in a way that works to some extent, but at some point you get into trouble. So um, if you apply this canonical quantization program, it's very difficult to make things kind of rigorously defined. So the, the problem was that you can write down things that look like they should be the right equations that you want to solve because they're basically the quantum version of the of the classical equations of gravity, the so-called Einstein equations. But um, then you get into very sort of serious trouble on the mathematical level. You have to make things well-defined in terms of mathematically speaking, operators acting on some kind of abstract space and so on and so forth. And somehow this program got stuck because people never really managed to make these things well-defined. Um, and then in the 1980s, um, basically there was a sort of a, a new idea in this program, which was to rewrite the classical theory of gravity in different variables. Mm -hmm. So what that means was, so usually we have a, uh, our space-time geometry is described by, uh, well, certain variables that you use that give you, for example, the curvature that I was talking about earlier. So um, in particular, usually we start with what's called the metric. So the metric tells us what distances are and what angles are, for example. So if we have two points, maybe, you know, separated by in space and time, so they are events, mm -hmm. events, so they are a certain point in space at a certain point in time, we can, we can measure the distance between them, um, whatever that means, um, by using this metric. And then if we have uh, sort of two directions pointing in sort of different directions, starting from the same event, we can define some kind of angle between them and things like that. So that's usually the object that you start with, with in your quantum theory. And that turned out to not really work. And so then in the 1980s, there was this uh, breakthrough by, by Ashtika, and he managed to sort of rewrite the same theory using different variables. Um, so the theory gives the same predictions. It's physically completely equivalent to normal general relativity, but it's written in a different language, if you want, if, if we can phrase it that way. And in fact, in a language that's much closer to what we use for the other forces of nature. So the, the usual uh, elementary forces that, that uh, act at the subatomic level, they are written in a certain language, which is the language of gauge theory, which one can think of as some kind of generalization of electromagnetism. So we all know about the electric and the magnetic uh, forces. If you make this a bit more general, you get to gauge theory, 
So the idea of Ashtika variables was to write gravity in the same language. So that sounds like a good idea, given that this worked very well for the other forces, right? We can write down consistent quantum theories for these other forces. In terms of gauge theory, we know how to do that. So then the idea was to apply similar techniques for, um, for general relativity. Um, there's lots of really, really detailed mathematical technicalities that I probably don't really have time to go into. But basically what we have to take seriously still is, um, well, read really the insight of relativity, which is that there are transformations that give you a map basically from one observer to another observer. And these are very, very general types of observers. So it, 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 in general relativity, in principle, I can describe the observations made by anyone sitting anywhere in the universe, moving at an arbitrary velocity in any direction and so on. And all these observers in principle have to agree in a way that is well defined on what space-time is. And so to incorporate that into the quantum theory turns out to be very, very difficult. Um, and then we have the second big problem, which is so-called background independence, which means that we don't have a space and time to begin with. So we don't, whatever we think our description of gravity is, it cannot really live on a predefined space and time. So these two things make life very, very hard. <laughs> Um, but using these kind of techniques from gauge theory, people manage to, to get very far with this program and to define the structures that you would normally want to see in a, in a quantum theory. So the space of states and, you know, uh, observables to some extent uh, that correspond to certain measurements and so on. Um, and, and these can actually be made well-defined in this framework in a way they cannot be made uh, in, in the metric language. So in a sense, the metric just to as a first check mm -hmm. for <laughs> going forward, yeah. moving forward, you have general relativity, which is written in some variables we call, namely the metric, which makes a lot of sense from a classical, you know, experimental and historical perspective. Namely, mm -hmm. space time has to do with things we measure with rulers and clocks. And metric is, I mean, the metric is the most natural way of expressing distances in space time, space, you know, rulers and time clocks. So generally you were referring to space time distances, which are, I mean, involve the metric and some measurements of space and time. But in general, the metric made a lot of sense in the context of general relativity, but it's quite different from the other forces from electromagnetism, quantum, I mean, chromodynamics, quantum chromodynamics in general, gauge theories, which are all those theories. So people managed, since it was really hard to try to apply canonical quantization, which is this set of magic rules, magic in the sense that, uh, and, and I mean, let me briefly comment on this, because people might be uh, thinking that we're just doing random stuff and throwing random, which is partially true, but not, <laughs> not completely in the sense that the reason for which these rules are kind of magic and not perfect is that we are trying to do everything backwards, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. From a, 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 you know, an outsider's perspective, the most natural thing would be to take the fundamental theory and then derive classical physics. Mm -hmm. We live in classical physics, know classical physics, and have to derive the thing of, of which classical physics is some kind of approximation. So we have to, I mean, be a bit open-minded and try to do it in different ways and so on and so forth. So canonical quantization was hard to apply to general relativity. So people rewrote general relativity in Ashtekar's variables, which make it look similar to gauge theories is, and more or less, this is where we are. You can apply canonical quantization and get to loop quantum gravity, right? Mm -hmm. Which are the main That's features right. of loop quantum gravity? What does it tell us about the world? Like mm -hmm. the, the most striking things, right? It tells us just to yeah. build intuition for it. I think the, yeah, I think the biggest new idea is that sort of the space-time continuum disappears and everything is replaced by sort of discrete structures. So it turns out that sort of, and this is, yeah, this is quite puzzling, I guess, when you start, because you think that you have this description of the classical theory in terms of this gauge field, and this is still a continuum field. So it's, you know, it's defined in a continuum well, there is some kind of space that you have to start with, which mm -hmm. doesn't have a metric, but you have to you have to use some notion of space. But this is a continuum. And then you start applying your rules of quantum theory, 
and you get discreteness. So in a sense, and again, this is a bit like the electromagnetic field where sort of, you know, the, the classical description is an electric field at each point in space and a magnetic field at each point in space. But suddenly the quantum theory has discrete excitation, has particles, the photons, right? So it's a bit like that. I mean, much more complicated, but it's a bit like that. So, so suddenly in terms of this classical picture of the continuum, we get discrete structures. So we get graphs in particular. Um, so we have sort of sort of lines that meet at vertices and that so form some kind of graph. Yes. And these are the fundamental structures that the theory um, is built on. And this is not something that you put in. This is really an, an, an output. This is something that comes out of the quantization. It's just the way in which you define the quantum states in this framework. <laughs> And so, um, so that is one notion of discreteness. The second notion of discreteness is if you now calculate something that you would like to observe, say, you know, the area of a surface or the volume of a region, the possible values for these uh, measurements are again not a continuum, but they are they're only discrete values that are allowed. So if you if you calculate the volume of any region of of space time in loop quantum gravity, you only have these finite uh, values that are possible for possible measurements. So in theory, an experiment would be able to distinguish this from a classical picture, right? Because you would only see... This is shocking, right? Just yeah. Let me jump in a bit. Like when we do physics, what we want to do is extract observables from a theory, right? Mm -hmm. Stuff we can measure in lamps. And in the context of quantum gravity, observables are the easiest possible ones, like the ones kids can measure, right? Areas of surfaces. And it turns out those observables are, I mean, follow quantum rules. So they fluctuate, there's some probability in there. You can find different values of the area if you measure repeatedly, mm -hmm. repeatedly at different moments in time. This is itself super weird, but it is quantized. Like areas cannot be infinitely small. They have a minimal size. And they are composed of these minimal sizes and they have some mm -hmm. eigenvalues, we would say, in physics. That's but right. This is striking. This is sorry if, if I interrupted you, you can go on. <laughs> <laughs> this was really like I wanted to make this super uh, yeah. strong because this is one important feature of loop quantum gravity, and it, it comes just for free, more or less for free from the theory. So mm -hmm. this is really cool. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I mean, this is something that you might expect. I mean, using your intuition from quantum mechanics, using examples of things that happen in other areas of quantum mechanics, you might expect something like this to happen. In fact, many people find it even conceptually much more appealing and pleasing to mm -hmm. think that sort of at the smaller scales, we don't have the continuum, right? We don't have an infinite number of physically distinct points, you know, even at a micrometer. Um, but there has to be some finite resolution to space and time. I think this is something that if you talk to non-experts, they might find it actually more appealing than the idea of the continuum. But it's anyway something we might expect from, from quantum mechanics. But yes, the fact that it does come out of this quantization is, is very striking. Um, and it opens up a lot of new possibilities for calculating things that are ill-defined or hard to define in the continuum picture. So example is black hole um entropy so the the, the counting of a, of the possible states of a of a quantum black hole mm -hmm. which you can do because you then have this kind of discreteness so the the number of states becomes finite rather than being infinite as it is in classical mm -hmm. in classical physics this is super interesting and as far as i understand i might not be up to date but the value you get for the black hole entropy up to a parameter, which is called the Mirzi parameter mm -hmm. fix, is the one you would expect from uh, semi-classical physics, right? Uh, this interview will come after one in which black hole thermodynamics have, <laughs> have been discussed a lot. So yeah. I assume our audience <laughs> will be comfortable with this, <laughs> right? Yeah, so this is this is an evolving field, and um, and you know people have found multiple ways of calculating this this entropy from different directions and using quite different physical arguments. Um, I mean, the, the the field started by really this kind of counting argument that is sort of the way people thought about it in the in the old days, where you really you have to physically count the the number of configurations that can be associated to the black hole, and and then you can compare that with your expectations. 
And of course, entropy can arise in other ways from more general kind of thermodynamic considerations. But it's true that in general, you always have this um, relation where you see the entropy as proportional to the area of the black hole, which is the most important um, result you want in this context. Okay, so just to push it a bit more, right? Uh, together with loop quantum gravity, as we said before, you mentioned group field theories, which mm -hmm. they come from there, but they are slightly different. So would you like to present group, group field theories? Like what, what's the main idea of this approach that uh, is itself an approach right to, to quantum gravity at this point? Mm -hmm. So there is a, yeah, so one has to introduce a few more concepts here. It's it's a little further removed from this canonical quantization picture. Um, so basically, so one thing that one can say is that in usual quantum field theory, um, we have this canonical quantization picture, but we also have what's called a path integral picture or covariant quantization, um, which, you know, is... Uh, quite a different way of thinking about quantum theory, um, but um, is is often perhaps seen as even more directly related to the to the classical world. So the the main idea of 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 the of the path integral or covariant quantization is that you know you specify some kind of process that you're interested in, in terms of some initial and some final state, and typically you want to calculate some kind of probability or some kind of amplitude between these configurations, which you know vaguely is related to the answer to a question like, you know, if I start from this initial configuration, um, how likely am I going to be to find this final configuration later? So these are the typical questions you want to ask if you relate to, to observation. And the answer and the path integral picture is that in a sense, you can obtain this amplitude by summing over all the possible ways to get from the initial to the final state with something called the amplitude, which is a, a complex number of modulus one. So you have to, to sum over lots of things that are basically sines and cosines. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually you get some number. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a very physical picture in terms of the particle, for example, if you're thinking of this double slit experiment where you know you have a particle that can go through the left or through the right slit and you don't know what it did. And eventually you will detect it somewhere else in order to calculate the likelihood of, of the particle ending up somewhere on the on the screen, you really have to look at all the possible paths that you know went through either of the slits and so on and sum over all these amplitudes. Um, and this is a, a method that we can use quite generally for defining uh, quantum theories. So it's also been applied basically to the to these graphs in loop quantum gravity, where now basically if you look at sort of the, the, the this discrete picture of space that you get in loop quantum gravity, you can ask similar questions, conceptually similar questions, sort of what is the amplitude to get from some initial configuration of these graphs and nodes and so on um, to, to a different one, maybe that is your final state. And the answer is again, uh, can be expressed as some kind of path integral. Um, mm -hmm. But now, because it's uh, a discrete theory and you you don't have the continuum of space-time, you only have these kind of discrete structures, The this integral becomes a sum. It becomes a very complicated sum over lots and lots and lots of discrete configurations. So in a sense, you're thinking of some, um, yeah, some discrete configuration of space with certain values for the volumes and areas, maybe glued together in some way could think of it in terms of some building blocks. Maybe we'll come back to that later. And you want to calculate basically what is the probability for this to evolve into something else. Um, and if you do this in the context of loop quantum gravity, this gets you into what is called spin form models. So these are then spin form amplitudes. Um, now the group field theory uh, approach is a way of looking at spin form amplitudes and looking at them again from a different angle, <laughs> um, which is um, in terms of a, a continuum, this is a bit hard to explain, but it's in terms of a more conventionally defined quantum field theory. Okay, so what I mean by that is, so you can, you can think of these amplitudes in themselves as the objects that define your theory because from these amplitudes, you can extract all the possible measurements. So in principle, they contain all the information that you that you need. 
So pardon um, me, what we typically do, but this is more general than the case of quantum yeah. particles, right? We use a theory to derive amplitudes like That's probabilities right. of us, and at least, as you said, likelihood of measuring something if we prepare the system in a given state, uh, mm -hmm. under certain conditions and so on. But given the complete set of all amplitudes, we can, in a sense, reconstruct or define the theory itself, right? Yes, that's right. So that's what we do in particle physics, for example. So this is a great example of what we do, say, if we want to interpret particle physics experiments at CERN. So we, we will have some underlying theory for our particles. We are interested in the interaction of some subatomic particles. We have some theory that's defined in the quantum regime that sort of is a proposal for how these things interact. And then we can run kind of our algorithm and extract all the possible amplitudes for possible experiments, which in this case is scattering experiments, right? So I'm sending some particles in with certain momenta and energies, and there's a range of possible outcomes, right? Different stuff will come out on the other side. So I have to repeat the experiment a million times and count the number of, you know, different outcomes that, that I got. And then I can compare that with this theoretical calculation of these different amplitudes. So in this case, sort of the theory in terms of what we call an action is kind of the primary thing. And then out of that, we get these amplitudes. Um, so now in the group field theory setting, basically the idea is to go backwards and basically say, we have these amplitudes that come from the spin form mm -hmm. approach to loop quantum gravity. Now, can we interpret those as arising from a particular action, which is kind of a simple thing you can write down in one line. It's something that theoretical physicists absolutely love. They always want to have the action to work with. And this is how most textbooks kind of start with, right? So from the action, you get the amplitudes. It's not strictly needed. You can have the amplitudes in, in themselves. And there are very successful research programs in quantum field theory that only work at the level of amplitudes. So it's absolutely not essential to have them as kind of coming from what we call the action, but it can help you a lot. So if you have this action, it's kind of basically a simple, again, a simple recipe that says, here's a thing, it fits in one line. And from this, you can calculate all the amplitudes. At least it is a, if it, if there is an action, I mean, assuming an action mm -hmm. is there and can be written down, it's an extremely efficient way of packing all your mm -hmm. information, right? Packing it up in a simple formula and from which you can derive all the amplitudes. I mean, working with a long list of amplitudes can be, cumbersome at times so <laughs> you would like an action right yeah that's right of course you would like to give some structure to this to this <laughs> mess uh of course there are other ways of doing this um not necessarily based on an action but this is one that has a long history in in physics and has certainly worked well for many other theories so in the group field theory setting that's basically what what you do so people manage to write down actions mm -hmm. in such a way that they then generate all the amplitudes of a particular spin form model that in itself is used in loop quantum gravity. So it's a little bit of a several steps intermediate process, but in the end, you come up with this rewriting basically of all the dynamics of your you know, discrete structures of space in terms of this action, which in itself is a purely abstract uh, mathematical object. Okay, so the path is more or less you have general relativity, you write it in something that looks like a gauge theory, at least in some mm -hmm. generalized version of that language. You canonically quantize it, get loop quantum gravity, write down mm -hmm. amplitudes, which are spin form models and all that. You have networks mm -hmm. propagating into other networks, and then you obtain group field theories as a way to pack that knowledge into some kind of super abstract, super mathematically uh, elegant uh, and interesting action. That's more mm -hmm. or less... The, the path you followed, right? Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, so basically what I'm giving you here is the historical development. Um, of course, in hindsight, quite often people could say, well, we could have started somewhere else. And this is also the case here. So, of course, you can develop spin form models, and this has also been done, not knowing anything about canonical loop quantum gravity. You might just want to say, I want a model of discrete structures in space and time interacting in some way that looks like it has something to do with general relativity. <laughs> and in this way, you might end up with a spin form model immediately sure. without coming from this canonical loop quantum gravity side. But but certainly that's, as far as I understand, the historical path that, that most people have followed. Okay, But this far, we, we've discussed the most theoretical, right, and conceptual aspects of the issue. But going back to phenomenology, going back to the word, 
Mm -hmm. And this will naturally be the last part of our discussion. I mean, set the stage for group field theories. Uh, what would you say about the practical, experimental, phenomenological implications of this? For instance, in the case of cosmology, if you want to start from something else, that's perfectly fine. But I'd like to end <laughs> to uh, to go towards cosmology. Mm -hmm. So that's a natural way to start from. Let's start from there, and mm -hmm. as you like. Yeah, so um, of course these theories are not exactly equivalent to general relativity. So we we started by discussing cosmology in the way we normally do it at the classical level using the picture of general relativity. So now if you modify general relativity, of course you're going to get a different type of cosmology. And there's many ways in which we can modify um, general relativity. And one of them is, of course, maybe the most drastic one is to replace it by some kind of quantum proposal mm -hmm. right for theory of space and time and so if you now try and do cosmology with um, with your given quantum theory of gravity you will be asking the same questions which is you know what happens to a very large geometry on the larger scales is it dynamical does it expand does it contract what happens to it how does it interact with matter so the questions will be the same mm -hmm. but in general you will of course get different answers um and in particular, the, the main thing that you would expect to have some impact is this kind of discreteness, right? So the fact that kind of areas and volumes don't have this continuum structure anymore, but they now, you know, have to take these kind of very specific discrete values. At some point, you would expect that to play a role in cosmology, in particular, coming back to the beginning, regarding this problem of the singularity. Right. So, you know, we had this discussion of the balloon and if you extrapolate it back, it goes to zero size. But that's the continuous process, the shrinking of the balloon to zero size. So now if there is actually some underlying discreteness structure, we might expect that to be visible at some point in this process. Sure. Like that's quantum gravity big... dynamics to become relevant, at least non-negligible at a given point. Exactly. In the rewinding time. Okay. Yes, that, that, that is what we expect. And uh, indeed, for example, the, the classical statement that sort of the volume, for example, of the universe would shrink to exactly zero, that immediately seems to be in conflict with this discreteness structure that we found in the, the quantum theory. Mm -hmm. So what do you, so this is, uh, as you said, this is in clear contradiction, right, at least at the first glance with what you would expect from quantum gravity, from discreteness, at least from this approach to the problem of quantum gravity, you already mentioned, and I mentioned there's many of them and we'll discuss them, but here, how, what do group field theories, what does loop quantum gravity, if the two suggest different things, you can comment on both, suggest about cosmology and in particular about early universe cosmology. Do they tell us something about what might have happened around that thing we call the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. So, um, in effect, I mean, if you want an intuitive picture, the uh, I mean, I was earlier talking about the volume going to zero, but also things like curvature and energy density and temperature and so on going to infinity um, at the Big Bang in the classical uh, theory, which which you know signals this breakdown somehow of of our description. Now, it turns out that if you apply the, the rules of, sort of loop quantum gravity or group field theory, in fact, they give fairly similar uh, answers to these kind of questions. And you define objects that you know characterize things like the curvature of the universe or you know the energy density in the universe and things like that. Um, turns out that these don't actually go all the way to, to infinity, but they hit basically a maximum. So... Um, this is, I think, even clearer in, in loop quantum gravity, where you can make this sort of mathematically more rigorous on a certain Hilbert space. Effectively, you get similar answers in, in group field theory, where you basically find that, you know, as you go backwards in time, in fact, the, the energy density of the universe will appear to be larger and larger and larger, but only up to a certain point. Um, so there is, a, there is basically a maximum that you hit. Um, which basically means that this um, uh, the sort of the expansion cannot be traced back all the way, but at some point it has to stop. And in fact, then if you push this even further, then you see that sort of before that there must have been some kind of period of contraction, okay. which which then sort of transitioned into the expanding universe that we are in today. 
Okay, so is this what you would refer to as a big bounce typically in research? Mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. That's the name we've, we've given to this. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. But that's yeah. right. So by, by a bounce in general, I mean, this is not necessarily restricted to quantum theories of gravity, but there is this general idea of a bounce in cosmology, which means that sort of there was a contracting universe, which um, again, you can, you can picture this using this balloon or any kind of spherical model of the universe, some kind of contraction, which then sort of terminates at some finite radius and then goes over into, into expansion. Okay. So um, th there's a few questions I'd like to ask you about this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Clearly, there's a lot to unpack. So for instance, what, what is the thing sourcing this? I mean, this shift between contraction and, I mean, going in the correct direction, right? You have a contraction and then you have an expansion. What, what's happening there? Like, why do you change regime in such a, drastic way is there something else coming in like some other uh, effect some quantum i don't know pressure something like is there any answer to this at least a suggested um yeah i mean you you can you could certainly describe it in those terms i think the idea is that sort of this is a this is an effect of quantum geometry right, right? where somehow you have you have compressed this universe to such an extent to such a high density that now this kind of you know underlying discrete structure mm -hmm. uh, becomes relevant and sort of stops this stops this contraction process. In the same way, again for this balloon model, given that uh, you know the, the, the surface is made up of some material that consists of atoms, mm -hmm. uh, you wouldn't be able to compress this this balloon to zero size because at some point the atoms would start like repelling each other and and so on. Um, so there is a little bit, this is just a, a picture, of course, not necessarily the, the correct description, but this is sort of the idea that sort of the, um, this, this underlying discreteness means that things cannot be uh, compressed to an, to an arbitrary amount. Um, and so one, one point is that the Einstein equations, which are our usual way of describing classical relativity, are very beautiful because they basically equate two different things. So they equate properties of the geometry, which have to do with curvature, with properties of the matter, which have to do with energy density and pressure and so on. So the, the Einstein equations basically tell you that at each point in the universe and at any given moment in time, some kind of curvature of the universe is equal to some kind of energy and pressure of the matter. So this is, a, in a sense, a unification of of the matter and the universe with space and time into, into something that sort of has to be in equilibrium, if you wish. So what that means is that if you now change things in general relativity and you make sort of corrections and you make things quantum, in a sense, you can have different interpretations to what's going on because you can change your idea of what the geometry side is doing, but you can also change your idea of what the matter side is doing. So in a sense, in quantum gravity, what we think we do is we change the idea of geometry, right? We turn it from continuum into some discrete structures, but we will be able to find a completely equivalent description where we say the geometry is unchanged, but now there's some new forces or some new matter doing something funny. Sure. So in that sense, in, for example, in loop quantum cosmology, as it's called, you will often find these so-called effective equations where basically put all the corrections coming from the quantum side basically into the matter. And then it looks like the matter is suddenly becoming repulsive. So it pushes yeah. its function when yeah. you compress it, then you, it pushes. Exactly. So normally gravity is of course attractive. So we expect some kind of matter to lead to an attraction. And basically what these effective equations tell you is that at some high value of the energy density, this this goes into reverse and it starts, you know, leading to a repulsion. Since this will be this will be uploaded on YouTube, so I'm a hundred percent sure this question would come anyway. So I'll ask it uh, <laughs> now in order to satisfy people watching. Uh, what about the cosmological constant? Because this is a natural question to ask right after this. Mm -hmm. uh, from this perspective, is it nothing more than a constant? Like, you know, like the bare mass, the like whatever, 
or does it emerge from this quantum dynamic? So the, it, it is perfectly fine if you answer that there's no answer at this point to this kind of question or definitive one. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of an open question, yeah. Um, and I think there's different approaches that people take in the in the community. I think this is already true in classical gravity, of course, so in, in, or in classical cosmology. Um, I mean, you can you can take the, the phenomenological point of view and say we have this dark energy, we don't know what it is, and it's some unknown substance that has certain phenomenological properties, which we'd like to understand better in the future. So that's just uh, a basic kind of observational point of view. You can take the theoretical point of view where you say you add a cosmological constant, or you don't do that and you add something else, for example, quintessence or some kind of interacting scalar field model that looks like a cosmological constant, maybe now. So we don't really know what the answer is in the classical theory. And I think in the quantum theory, there's sort of these approaches have their equivalent. So, you know, there are ways of incorporating a lambda mm -hmm. into the theory just as a parameter, something you can add to your theory. You can do that in quantum cosmology um, and loop quantum gravity, in fact. And the value there would not be restricted. It's just a free parameter that you can add in the same way that you can add it to, to Einstein's equations in the classical theory. But there's also this emergent point of view where you say that maybe that's not what we should be doing. We shouldn't be adding this arbitrary free parameter into our theory, but we should be studying carefully what you know the, the fundamental dynamics of quantum gravity actually tell us. Mm -hmm. And maybe there is something that looks like um, a cosmological like constant. Or a dark cosmological energy. constant, yes. I mean, in certain simplified models of group field theory, this, for example, can be seen. So these are very simplistic models at this point, but what you can see there is that, you know, certain type of interactions in your fundamental theory of, you know, your discrete structures in space may look like leading to an effective dark energy or cosmological constant, even though you didn't put that necessarily in the beginning. So that is that is another possibility. Um, to understand this more in more detail, of course, we have to understand better the dynamics of these theories sure. um, at large scales. And one last question, because this is important. Like, no, two last questions. The first one is that together with dark energy, people will probably or would probably ask us something about dark matter or the, 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 the issue that dark matter is supposed to solve, uh, mm -hmm. namely. Uh, large-scale divergences from uh, general relativity. Uh, from the perspective of group field theories, loop quantum gravity, loop quantum cosmology, and so on, could you also have some large-scale deviations, for instance, when considering like rotational velocities of galactic rings and all that? I mean, those things we observe in, in the lab with, uh, you know, all the nice equipment and all that <laughs> and that i mean they, they, they diverge from general relativity people typically expect some dark matter to be there to solve the mm -hmm. issue but would you expect this might be answered without dark matter coming from some correction like quantum correction i know this is not i mean i don't know if this is mm -hmm. uh, the, I, I i don't expect a full answer but i don't know what the perspective <laughs> of these kind of approaches is to the um yeah, I mean, this is this is more speculative because I don't think very much work has been uh, has been done in this direction. Um, of course, there are various places in which you seem to need dark matter, but one of them is the the rotation curves of, of galaxies that you described. But also in the early universe, we seem to somehow require the correct matter energy density to get the the cosmic microwave background and this kind of things. Um, so. So I don't have any feeling for what will happen to that uh, long term because we, there's too much work that I think needs to be done. But I think if you're asking more generally about large scale modifications to um, generativity and the Einstein equations, I think on general grounds, you would absolutely expect those to be there. I mean, there is, in a sense, what you have done in, in, in getting to that point is you have taken a classical theory and applied your rules of canonical quantization and so on, and maybe you know found some quantum description that makes sense, but that does not imply that you know what comes out of this quantum description will always be very very close or identical to the classical description you started with. This is important. Um, this is exactly where I wanted to get, namely the fact that quantum gravity might not only imply short scale deviations. Mm -hmm but also, I mean, they, when they accumulate or they can give you a classical limit, 
general relativity plus some corrections that are irrelevant at our scales, but might become relevant at large scales. Who knows? So that's the point. I mean, it's way more general than you can expect yeah. than just short scale. That's yeah. right. So yeah. there, there is always some general intuition in physics, uh, in quantum field theory, that somehow suggests that the, the, the corrections are relevant at high energies and at small distances. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where things will deviate from the classical world. But it's not necessarily true at all. I mean, you can get what's called infrared effects and infrared modifications that can actually be very long range. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular in quantum gravity, I think that's even more pressing than in other theories because um, this kind of separation of scales and you know, talking about what is the short scales and what is the long distances doesn't even make sense in the beginning because we don't have a notion of scale to begin with, right? Everything only has to emerge from the theory only afterwards in some limit and with some approximations, we may be able to say, you know, this is a large scale or a short scale effect for this particular configuration. So in that context, you would even less um, expect this kind of clear separation where you can say all this funny quantum stuff is now confined to the to the microscopic scale. So in fact, many people in quantum gravity, I think from coming from many directions, not just quantum gravity and, and group field theory would in fact potentially expect quite drastic modifications to relativity general relativity on large scales and this might help us with things like dark energy and dark matter if we want to be optimistic <laughs> <laughs> well it, we don't know but we push this to the boundary and i think this is important just to make clear what has been done what still has to be done to be done like students are watching us so some of them might mm -hmm. you know take <laughs> the challenge on and, and try to solve these issues. Uh, on, you know, uh, th this is slightly different. This is not properly physics, not properly related to the content of our interview. But since, as I said, many students will be hopefully watching us, I would like to conclude the interview with a more personal question. May I? Mm -hmm. Of course. Why quantum gravity? Why did you choose quantum gravity? What <laughs> do you like about it? Did you find yourself in it and just enjoy the ride? Or there was some specific reason that pushed you here? Um, I think it sort of, it started by learning about the two frameworks that we have, um, learning about classical general relativity and also about quantum field theory and being completely fascinated by, by both. I mean, both of them are absolutely incredible kind of conceptual revolutions um, when you first think about them. And so I think in a sense, I always found these most fundamental questions particularly attractive. Um, and well, then, you know, soon enough, you study quantum field theory uh, for six months or, or maybe less, and somebody tells you that, you know, we have one big problem that is that is open, which is how to apply this to general relativity, and nobody knows how to do it. Um, or depending on where they come from, they might, you know, sell a particular approach maybe that they, that they like and say, this is the best approach we have. Um, and I was really intrigued by this. I think this is probably the story that, that many people in this field have had, was sort of you, you ask yourself, why is it that we haven't solved this problem? Because, you know, if you when, once you learn about the rules of quantum field theory, of course, in the beginning, a lot of things are really difficult to understand, how to make sense of infinities and renormalization and these kind of things that we don't really have the time, I guess, to talk about here. But there were mathematical difficulties, but they were overcome within 10 or 20 years, right? It took... So the first generation of physicists couldn't quite work them out. Their students took over and they solved the problems. And basically within 20 or 30 years, we knew what quantum field theory was and we could apply it to pretty much any system we could think of. Similar for general relativity, of course, if you look at back at what's, what was achieved by, by Einstein, it's absolutely incredible. Um, and, and there were many obstacles along the way to finding the theory. But again, they were overcome within sort of few years, right? I mean, there was a big problem, a conceptual problem, and people sat down and thought very hard, in this case, mostly Einstein, of course, um, by himself, and then came up with the answer. So with quantum gravity, we have nothing like that. I mean, we have huge challenges that have been open for decades. And of course, there is progress um, on all fronts, um, but it's slow <laughs> compared to these historic precedents. 
And I think I just always found that very fascinating. Um, so in a sense, of course, you need a lot of patience in this field and a lot of persistence. Um, but um, sort of the, the, the conceptual foundations kind of of these two frameworks seem somehow too important to uh, to not look for the unification. Well, just... this was absolutely satisfying. So uh, with this, I would like to thank you very much for your time and help. I think this was extremely interesting and it will be for those people that will dare listening <laughs> to us on YouTube. <laughs> And once more, thank you very much. Great. Yes, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.